strength is reliant upon, leaning always upon God's holiness. Cause he pulled me out of the Come on. 
God wants to encourage you today. To encourage means to give someone courage and someone, maybe many of us in the room, we feel like we don't have what it takes to keep going. To walk out of the room and say, yeah, I have the strength I need to fulfill the call that God has placed on my life. And I believe so, so much right now, God wants to encourage you. When he says, be strong, you need to know the kind of father that God is. <laughs> God is not the father who finds a child who gets afraid of something and he thinks you shouldn't be afraid of that, so just be strong, don't be afraid. That's, that's not God, that's not what he's like. You know what he's like? He says, be not afraid, for I am with you. He's the father who says, yeah, I get that that's scary. I understand why that scares your heart from the position you're sitting in, that makes a lot of sense. And I know I can't sense you into knowing that you should not be afraid, but here's what I can do. I can be with you. And this is what God wants you to hear today. <laughs> you might be afraid, but he's saying, be strong, be not afraid, for I am with you. And sometimes we're seeking the answer and we say, God, what is the answer to this? Why are the days so evil? Why are the days so dark? And there are times where God will speak a word and we will sense an answer. But can I tell you, there's many times I don't have an answer. But what you get every single time you come to God is you get Him. So today, we gotta sing that chorus one more time because if you came in and you sense what I sense, you said, how do I have the courage to continue? How do I have the courage to walk back out into the darkness and bring the light of Jesus? Here's how you do it. He's with you. He's with us. So what we're gonna sing is we're going to open up our eyes and we're going to see towards heaven and open our hands and say, God, we remind our souls that you're with us here right now. So why don't you just open your hands and let's sing that together. Come on, lift your voice, sing. Be strong. If you're thankful for that, well, can you lift up your praise to God? Say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for who you are, God. Yes. Oh, man. Man, I, I need this every week. You know, this is why we gather as God's people. It's like we need this bit of a reset. And, and when I'm not strong enough, I get strength by just seeing you. And this is why we gather as God's people. And we also continue in our worship as we give. We give towards the purposes of God. And those are listed on the screen right now. There are four ways to give as we partner with what God's doing here in our church, here in our city, and across the world. So let me just pray for us as we continue in worship. Father, thank you for the kind of father that you are. Thank you for being with us. And as we stare at whatever valley is before us, we know you are not calling us to walk into that valley alone but you will walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death. And that's why we say we hold on to you. You are our answer, you are our solution, and you are the one that we worship. So we bring these songs, we bring our tithes, we bring our offering, we bring it all to you, God, because you're worthy of that kind of worship. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Come on, let's keep worshiping the Lord.
Worthy, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you so much for singing and leaning in. We love being with the people of God here at New Life Church. In a moment, we're going to continue with our service. Pastor Brady is bringing the word again this week. <laughs> but before, before he does that, how about you turn to the left of you, to the right of you, shake someone's hand, hug someone, greet someone with the love of the Lord this morning. We'll be right back. Good morning, New Life North. Thanks for joining us online. My name is Matthew. And my name is Beth. If this is your first time joining in today, or if you just want some more information on some of our ministries, you can click the link below. And if you're on Facebook or YouTube, would you chat below where you're joining us from so we can say hi. All right, now it's time to lean in, grab your Bibles, grab your notebooks, and let's listen to an incredible message together. Good morning. How are you? You doing good? Doing okay? Come on, shout back at me. You doing okay? All right. Good worship. I needed every song we sang this morning. I, th I told the Wednesday night, first Wednesday crowd, but <laughs> when late Wednesday afternoon, I'm out in the backyard, not paying attention, and I'm walking back up my back steps, and I tripped and fell and came down like on both kneecaps on concrete. Yeah, if all the old guys in the room, that hurts, right? So, <laughs> So if you see me like walking a little gingerly, I didn't break anything, but you know, when you're 56, there's no gracious way to like fall. And if, when you fall, you feel like Jabba the Hutt. You just can't move, right? Just, but, so anyway, I'm slowly recovering, but I do have some pretty good bruises. I, I, I would like to show you, but I'm not, okay? It's just too much for you to see today if you saw bruised kneecaps from the old guy, okay? so. Anyway, it's good. it's good to be here. I thought, it's, you know, I feel blessed to be here today with you guys. Not one thing, it's the other, right? So, so good. Turning your Bibles to 1 John, 1 John. A lot of you know if you've been coming to church, I'm a, I'm a really big sports fan. It's a borderline idol to me. I mean, I love sports. I played sports in high school, won a state championship my senior year of high school in baseball, went to college, I was a sports editor, for my college newspaper. I was the guy that did the PA announcing at football and baseball games, now batting number 33, I, would, I was that guy. And then I did play-by-play -play on the radio for college, high school, and professional sports teams. I was uh, the double A radio broadcaster for the San Francisco Giants for three years when I was a young man. So I'm saying all that, sports is a big deal to me. I know sports, I understand sports, I coach, I, I, if I probably wasn't a pastor, I would probably be a coach or a broadcaster or something like that, you know? So the reason I'm saying that is I know sports. And I know uh, that the great teams, the really great championship teams, regardless of the sport, the really great effective teams have plays in their playbook that when they run those plays, they work. When LeBron James is coming down the middle of the court and he is determined to get to the, to the hoop, he's gonna to get to the basket. He's 6'8", 250 pounds. You're not going to stop him. There's just something great about watching these athletes when they make up their mind and everyone knows what they're about to do, they still get it done. Now, that's sports. We have an enemy who's been running the same three plays from the beginning of time, three temptations. And we find these temptations in the Genesis. Genesis chapter three is when we first see this playbook opened up to us. And then it's repeated to us in 1 John chapter two. Three temptations. So in last week, we talked about walking in the light. We talked about what does it mean to come into the light? What does it mean to be brought out of darkness into his marvelous light? In chapter two, what we're gonna look at today, John describes the way the world motivates us compared to the way that God motivates us. So you know you're being motivated, right? You know you're being manipulated and motivated. Do you know that, right? From the moment you walked up, woke up this morning, from the moment you looked at a video screen or turned on your television or whatever you do, whatever information you receive today, 
Their, their desire is to motivate you or to manipulate you into behaving or believing a certain way. We, that, that's true, right? I, I'm not making that up and I'm not trying to say it's all evil. A lot of people like me today, I'm trying to motivate you, not manipulate you, I will never manipulate, but I am certainly trying to motivate you today to read 1 John 2 on your own and to say yes to a better way of living your life. I, so I wanna say that up front. I'm here today to motivate you toward a life of living, serving and following Jesus. That is in my heart. I wanna confess that before you today. That's the only motivation I have. So the question I have today, if that is my primary motivation is to help us to fall in love with Jesus and follow Jesus more completely, more fully, more be, be better people for following Jesus. What draws us away from God's best? What is really drawing us away from Jesus right now? So we you know, wake up every day, my Pam and I, we've been married 33 years, and we have this uh, saying in our marriage, it's like every day, Pam and I wanna lean in toward one another. The reason we've been happily, mostly happily married for 33 years, I, was, I tell people we have a semi-glorious marriage. <laughs> and it's not always perfect, I don't wanna paint that picture. We fuss every once in a while, Pam wins and I get over it, right? That's how it all works out. <laughs> but the way you stay married, all the married couples, if you wanna be married, if you know someone who's married, if, or any, really any relationship of any importance in your life, if you want a close friend, uh, a business partner. This is the way you keep those relationships healthy. You lean toward them. In other words, physically, emotionally, mentally, you're leaning toward one another. You're not pulling against one another. You're not fighting against one another. You're not competing with one another. You're complimenting one another, right? Leaning toward one another. Well, this is also the way you stay close to Jesus. You have to wake up every morning and say, I'm gonna lean in toward Jesus, and I'm going to be aware of forces that want to pull me away from Jesus. And those are evil forces in the world. Listen very carefully. I wanna be very clear about that. We have evil forces in the world that are very real, that really do want you to turn away from Jesus. And these forces are world-class at what they do. They're very, very skilled at pulling you away from Jesus. Now, the good news is these very skilled enemies were all defeated at the cross. Amen. Every one of them, all of them, every one of them. <clears throat> so we, we, we serve the victorious king, the resurrected one. The resurrection is what caused us now to be able to live in the fullness of the victory, right? All right, now John knows this. The writer of this book knew Jesus personally. And I said last week there's some debate about which John actually wrote 1 John. It could be John the Elder or John the Revelator. But either way, either person, both people followed Jesus. They talked with Jesus personally. They saw him after the resurrection. They were firsthand witnesses of the life of Jesus, in other words. All right, let's open up the Bible. 1 John chapter 2, verse 7. It's very important that we catch this. It's verse 7. John is telling the people, I am not writing you a new command. You know, this is really the whole point of church. It's not to come here and learn something new. And it may be new to some of you, but most of the time what you hear in church is not something new. It's something true. In other words, if it's new, it's probably not true. And if it is true, it's probably not new. Come on, somebody say amen. So I'm not here today to bring some new thing to you. What I want to do is preach something that is true to you. That's why John says here, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had from the beginning. Now, what is he talking about? Now, he's talking primarily to a Jewish audience. There were, there were certainly Gentiles coming to faith at this time, but the churches still were majority Jewish believers. And he's telling them the story of Genesis chapter three. Now I'm gonna go back there. Let's go, this is the front of your Bible, right? Your grandmother signed it, open it up. Chapter one, two, three, all right? Chapter three, verse six. This is the story of Adam and Eve. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye. 
So it was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom. And there we have the three temptations. All nicely wrapped right there. She saw three things. When she saw the fruit, she saw three things about the fruit that you need to catch here. It was good for food, that's one. Pleasing to the eye, it was a good looking piece of fruit. And hey, if I eat this fruit, it might have magical powers to make me something more important than I really am. And she took it and ate it, and we have never been the same since. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he didn't ask any questions, he did exactly what his wife told him, and ate it. And we've never been the same since. All right, now catch that, it was good, it looked good, it tasted good, and it had magical powers. <laughs> All right, to go back to 1 John now, go back, flip, I'll give you five seconds to flip back. 1 John chapter two, verse 15. Now remember, John is about to tell us what keeps us from walking in the light. J chapter one, walk in the light. Chapter two, this is what's gonna keep you in the darkness if you're not careful. Verse 15, he says, do not love the world are the things in the world. We probably could camp out right there for about the next 12 years. And I could come every Sunday and preach on that text and we would not run out of temptations and sins to talk about. Somebody say amen. amen. It doesn't mean we're not supposed to be concerned about the world. It doesn't mean that we're not supposed to live in the world. It doesn't mean that we're not supposed to make the world better. It doesn't mean we're not supposed to mow our yard and bathe our children and take care of our neighbor. It doesn't mean any of that. He's talking about what is your first love? Who has your primary worship? When it, when, if it all came down to it, who would you choose to worship? That's what he's talking about here. That word love is a deeply spiritual word that he's using here. He's talking about the act of worship, adoration. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, now we're about to hear Genesis 3 repeated back to us, okay? For all that is in the world, here's the three temptations. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, what you see, longing for something, seeing something, and the pride of life, wanting to be something that you're not. It is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God will abide forever and ever and ever. His kingdom will have no end. Can we pray together? This is a heavy message now. Are you, I'm gonna smile when I say it, but it's heavy. So we better pray a bit. Let's pray a minute before we get into this. Father, we ask today, would you speak to us? Would you challenge us and change us? Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you meddle with us today? Mess with us today? Convict us today? Lord, make us into your image today. And we ask it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen and amen. So let's look at these three temptations. Again, think of it as a, a team. Uh, uh, think of it, if, you, if you're a football fan, think of it as calling the same three plays over and over again, and you know what the play is, but you can't stop it. Those are the great football teams. So here are the three temptations that have been happening since the beginning of humankind that are still happening today, and I'm, I'm here to show them to you so you don't have to be under their spell. The first one he says is the lust of the flesh. The word lust is, is, is very complicated, but let me tell you what it is. Lust is cravings for things that are forbidden are things that can harm us when done in excess. So it's not like uh, lusting after some, everything is, uh, it's not like everything that you, like food for example, all right? This is a good one for me to talk about. Food, I like food. I like particular kinds of food, but I know if I eat too much of that particular kind of food, it will harm me. <clears throat> so lust is an appetite for things that have been forbidden by scripture, 
are good things that need to be done in moderation, but we go to the excess. That's what lust does. Lust takes you past the boundary lines. I know people that, that tell me all the time, say, Pastor Brady, I'm always living on the edge. Well, you need to step away from the edge. <laughs> Don't live on the edge. Live in the happy playground center with fences around you. This is the way, listen, this is what I tell people about God. God built us a giant playground with every imaginable toy on the playground and he put in a huge fence all the way around it and there is plenty of room to roam and run. Just stay within the boundaries. Stay right there, you'll have all the fun that you want. I'm not trying to draw you into some kind of, uh, you know, moralistic, heavy-handed, legalistic life. I believe that the Lord wants us to laugh and have fun and tell jokes and be joyful and enjoy good food and drink, enjoy everything that God's put in front of us, as long as it doesn't become an idol of worship or done in an excessive way that causes us harm. And there are boundaries, that's why those fences are there. There are sexual boundaries, there are financial boundaries, there are physical health boundaries that God has placed in our lives. And he's saying, listen, have all the fun you want, rip and romp and have fun and enjoy your life, but stay within these boundaries. Why does he do that? Because he loves us, he knows what we're capable of. And when you give in to the lust, you are determined to run through those boundaries. You're determined to run out in the highway. You're it, it, it's going to kill you, it will harm you. We used to do this with our kids all the time when our kids were little. Hey, this is where you can play, out in the front yard. I would walk out there and physically show them where the boundaries were. Get on your bike, you can ride all over here. Do not cross that boundary. Now they, they, they tested it a few times. Dad would go out, I'd go out and say, listen, here is fun, there is danger. Fun, danger. Fun, danger, and it's real. Real danger. And I had to, how many times did I have to do that? A hundred, every weekend. Listen, I mean, how many times your parents have to tell you to pick up your clothes? A hundred, every weekend. Then this is what God's doing today, saying, listen, these are good boundaries. He's not trying to take joy out of your life. He's trying to give joy back to you. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. He is the God of joy, but he's also the God of boundaries. So Eve, even when she saw the fruit, he had established boundaries. What did, God, what did God say to Adam and Eve? Eat everything. There's plenty of food in the Garden of Eden. Just don't eat that. But when Eve saw that, she said, the fruit is good for food. You see, lust is meeting legitimate appetites in illegitimate ways. There's, you know, we all need certain things. We need food, we need water, we need to put our feet in dirt. Basically, we're all potted plants with complex emotions. <laughs> you know, you need the same thing your potted plant needs. You need to put your feet in the dirt every once in a while. You need some water and you need some sunshine every day. We're potted plants with complex emotions, right? Somebody say amen. amen. That's who we are. So we have these legitimate needs. We need food and water and shelter. We need community. We need human contact. Some of you need less than others. Some of the introverts say, I don't need that much. I need a little, not a lot. All the extroverts say, I can't get enough, right? So, but we all need it. We're all sexual beings. So sex is not a bad thing. The Bible talks about it from the very beginning. Those babies didn't come from nowhere. I mean, their sex was happening at the beginning of the Bible to the end. But how do we meet those needs? How do we fulfill the God-given desires that are in our lives? He says, Adam and Eve had plenty of other food. Listen, here's what I wanna tell you about lust. The enemy's telling you that you can't find it any other place, and that's not true. What the enemy says to you is says, well, your wife doesn't look at you the way she used to, so go find sex somewhere else. No, she's enough. He is enough. When you cultivate the right kind of marriage, it's plenty. When you, when you start looking for something, what you, what the lie that you believe when you start thinking about a marital affair or when you start thinking about other things, the lie that you believe is that God has not provided enough in this spot 
so I have to go look somewhere else to get my needs met. That's the lie of the enemy. I've sat with too many men and women over 28 years of ministry, it's the same lie. Listen, the, the blessing is at home. God's blessing for your life is at your house waiting for you. That tell, I've, I can't tell you how many hundreds of men and women I've said that to. Go home and cultivate the soil there and the fruit will appear. Go there and tend, tend your pastures. Take care of the people around you that God's given you. God has not withheld one good thing from any of us. Somebody say amen to that. God has not withheld any good thing for you. There's plenty. Adam and Eve believed a lie that God had not provided for them. So I'm gonna, I've gotta go take something because God's not providing. So the lust of the eyes, meeting legitimate appetites in illegitimate ways. All right, here's the second thing. It says the lust of the eyes. When Eve saw it, she said, that, that fruit is gonna taste good, but it looks good too. Of all the fruit that I have seen today, that is the best looking fruit. Eve says the fruit is pleasing to the eye. <laughs> I, I, Pam and I, when we were a young married couple, we were so foolish in some ways. You know, we were in our 20s and we lived, at, when we, when we, around 30 or 31, we moved to Dallas, Fort Worth. And we were living in one of those starter neighborhoods where they were building new houses all around us. So we bought one of them because we were a starter couple who so we were buying a starter home. You know, there's homes like 5,000 homes within a half mile of you, you know, this everywhere. But we were in, we were with suburban Brady, suburban Brady, Pam, and we had one of those little houses that was brand new when we bought it. And if, if you ever walk into a brand new house, <sighs> carpet, paint, it's, it's, it's just the, the combination of those smells, sawdust, carpet, paint, the aroma. There's something, I don't know what's in that, but it is super intoxicating and super addictive. Like you start smelling that and then you walk to your house five years later and it smells like rotten Cheerios <laughs> and Chihuahua or whatever. And then you go to your neighbor's house and that's a brand new house and it smells like new carpet new paint, sawdust. You go back to your house and it's like the uh, po toddler apocalypse has happened, <laughs> right? Toddler tornado. And I, what happens in your soul is you start, you, you, you start looking at things. You start wanting something that looks newer and better. Listen, this week, all the commercials that you see and watch, take a little note, every time you hear this phrase this week, Get the thing that you deserve. I actually heard this the other day. Get the dog food your dog deserves. I don't have a dog. I wanted to buy the dog food because I didn't want to, I don't even have a dog. But I want to take something away from my dog that he deserves. I mean, that's, it's almost like a fundamental, con they're adding to the constitution every week the things that life, liberty, pursuit of happiness and dog food and teeth whitener and all these things that we deserve now, like it's a constitutional right being voted on by Congress. But what happens is we look at things we adore and our adoration becomes worship. You start looking at things and you become, listen, here's what Psalm 101 says. Psalm 101 says, I will set before my eyes no vile thing. What, what is vile? Vile is something that, that Someone else has, but you don't. It's not yours. It doesn't belong to me. And what happens is you start getting a feeling of being discontent. And then the advertisers have you when you become discontent. See, because here's what happens. Comparison is the thief of joy. And the reason many of us are not living joy-filled lives is we're not content. Listen, you know, listen, we live in Colorado. Have you been to Iowa? Have you been to Kansas, Louisiana? We live here, thank God, right? I mean, so every day, if you can't think of one other thing to be excited about, look at Pikes Peak, you get to see that every single day. From the worst neighborhood in town, they have the same view as everybody else does. Maybe your house is not as big as your neighbor's, but you got the same mountain to look at. 
So what happens is we start looking around this beautiful place we get to live in. It's not enough. Well, I mean, I, could have, I wish we had more water here. You know, there's bighorn sheep in my neighbor's yard. I don't have anything. I have a rabbit. I mean, come on. <laughs> Appetites are normal and they can be satisfied, but lust is never satisfied. Lust is lust of the eyes. It's never enough. That's better and bigger. I should have that. I need that. Listen, I tell young married couples all the time, buy a car, pay cash for it, and drive it until the wheels fall off of it. And refuse to get in your friend's new car because it's gonna it'll wreck you. Keep, it, keep yours clean, okay? Spray some stuff in it or something. But don't go sit the other one because you'll start comparing. I need a new car. They have a 40 inch flat screen in the front of their car now. I mean, look at this. I still got a knob on my radio. They have like a flat screen. <laughs> Psalm 119, turn my heart away. Turn my heart toward your statues and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. This is a good prayer to pray. Turn, my, Lord, today I pray that my eyes would be locked in on the blessings that you have given me and not the things that I deserve, but the things that I have. Lord, help me to determine what is a need and what is a want. And they're, they're not the same, by the way. I need food, I need water, I need shelter. I want a lot of other stuff. Determining that. He says, you preserve my life according to your word. Here's the third thing, the third, third temptation is the pride of life. I am greater than I think. We have it, most of us are living in two realities. We have a really low opinion of ourselves or we have a very exalted opinion of ourselves. And the happy medium is where God wants us to be. Listen, you know, we you know one of the joys of getting older is knowing who I am and knowing who I'm not and being okay with that. That's really the gotta be, that's gotta be true for all of us at some point now. And I give people in their, you know, students, college age kids, 20s and 30 something, I give you a lot of grace because you're still trying to figure that out. But by the time you hit 40, you should be hitting your stride. You should know the lane you should be running in, right? Run your, in your lane, the one that God gave you, run. You're looking around for another race to run. You don't even like the sport you're in. Now run your race. Look at the thing, look how he mapped it out for us. Eve said, this fruit will give me wisdom. But what she was saying was, this fruit will make me God less likely to call on the Lord, is what she was saying. If I eat this, I'm not going to need God as much. So asking for wisdom, I mean, the Bible is very clear about us asking for wisdom. What she was saying was, if I eat this fruit, I am gonna become more like God and less needy of him. I will not want to take so many walks in the morning. You know what happened after they sinned? God shows up for his morning walk with them and they're hiding from him. I don't know about you, but I would give everything in my life to walk with God every morning like that. Physically walk with Jesus every morning. I mean, every, there's not one thing I own I wouldn't give away for that. But they, they, the first thing they surrendered after they sinned was their morning walk. Companionship with God himself, who would come down in the cool of the morning to check on them, physically check on them. And one morning he shows up for the walk and they're hiding. Why? Because they had bought into a lie that we really don't need God as much. I did this. Here's, here's, a, here's the lie, okay? I did this. Look what I have done. I was on the phone. I have, you know, I have mentors. I have some older pastors that I call. And I called both of them on the same day this week and just was giving them a report, telling them, well, you know, it's good, bad, the ugly that's happening. And they, they give me such good feedback. They pray over me. They give me good, wise counsel. And they, they, they check on me. They ask about Pam and the kids. And this one, one of my friends said to me this week, he said, Pastor Brady, you have so much to give God glory over. I went, I, I needed to hear that. You have so much going on in your life that you can give God glory for it. Give God glory for all of it. And it wasn't because I was being cocky or prideful. He was just, as a good mentor, he was saying to me, Pastor Brady, the Lord's blessed you. Tell him, tell him that he's blessed you. Tell, remind God of how good he is. Not because he's some egomaniac out there that just needs constant affirmation, he's not that. 
It's because it's for us, right? So we don't look up one day and we've become our own little God. I tried being God, I'm awful at it. I'm terrible at it. Now listen, you're not as good as you think either. I, but this is a lie. I did this, look at what I have done. I don't need God or anyone else. Ultimately, what happens, you, uh, people are asking me all the time about humility and what does it mean to be prideful or humble. I say, listen, it's very simple. Humility is trust. Humility is trusting the Lord. Humility is saying, I'm, I don't have to make, I don't have to figure all this out. I, I'm not responsible to figure out every single issue that comes before me. I can trust the Lord. Lord, you will lead me in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake if I trust you. If I can just put my trust in you, if I can just give you the glory and get out of the way. And many of us are trying to manipulate God to get more from him instead of just trusting him. Stop asking God for more and say, Lord, let me trust you more. You know what happens here? Here's the, I'm not trying to give you some magic formula here. Let me tell you what happens. If you'll stop asking God to give you something and start telling him thank you more, you know what you'll get? You'll get more. This is, in fact, this fall, I'm gonna preach through the book of 1 Kings this fall with you. So starting in August, we're gonna go through 1 Kings. And one of the best stories in the opening chapters of 1 Kings is the prayer of Solomon. Solomon said, Lord, I cannot, I don't have enough wisdom, enough power to rule over a kingdom this big. So Lord, would you just give me wisdom? I don't need horses or chariots or wealth or the defeat of my enemies, just give me wisdom. And the Lord said, I will give you wisdom and I will give you everything that you did not ask for. The table of Jesus is a reversal of the Garden of Eden. What, we, what we're about to do is a complete reversal. And I want you to think about the elements that we're taking. It's very important to understand it's bread and wine. Two things that are, that are made with natural elements crafted by man. There's not a bread bush or a wine bush in your backyard. You take the grain and you make it into bread with human effort, right? You take the grapes and make it into wine with human ingenuity, right? So we take what we think we made and we give it to the Lord and he redeems it. The table of Jesus is a reversal of these three temptations. Eve took the fruit because of pride and Jesus asks us to come humbly and receive a humble meal. To come humbly before him today and recognizing that all of us can be led astray by the, by the lust of our eyes, the lust of our flesh and the pride of life. It's, listen, here's the choice we have to make today. And I wrote this out and I know this is kind of a complicated. Listen, there's two groups of people in the room, two groups of people watching online. There is one group that you have an insistence on our independence from God. You're determined to do it your own way. And listen, I, I'm not mad at you. I'm just, I'm just, I'm concerned for you. Cause I know where this path's leading you. It's leading you into, into bondage, into the slavery of sin, the bondage of, 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 of sin. I hate when I see that on people's lives. That's why I don't get upset with sinners. Sinners sin. Dogs bark, cats meow, sinners sin. Why, why are you getting mad at people, at sinners? I mean, I see sin out in the world. I'm not mad at them. That's what sinners do. Sinners make a mess of their lives. So do righteous people, by the way. We're not so great either. All of us need grace. And there's a second group and I'm in this group and I'm, every morning I have to wake up and remind myself that I want to stay in this group. A group of people that have an insistence of being completely dependent on God. So today, my flesh is going to ask me to do things that violate that. Today, I'm gonna to see things that want to draw me away. Today, my pride is gonna to try to lead me away from a dependence on who God is. The Father in heaven, I declare today, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that I am completely, unashamedly dependent on the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you take me by the hand today and use me for your purposes? Would you give me grace for every person that I meet? 
Would you give me wisdom for every problem that I encounter? Above all else, would you guard my heart? For from it is the wellspring of my life. Guard the condition of my heart today, Lord. And we do that when we stand together, stand with me. And I want those of you that serve the communion elements to come forward. We do that when we come together and pray, when we confess. Can we just take a moment? We've got plenty of time this morning. Would you just call yourself into account? I, I'm not here to, to shame or embarrass anyone. That's the Holy Spirit's work is to come and convict us. But maybe you're here today and you are, there's a flesh, your flesh, you're meeting legitimate appetites in illegitimate ways. Would you just confess before the Lord? He's God, he's gracious, he's good. He, he's heard it before, by the way. Say, Father in heaven, I, my flesh is out of control. Just tell him. This area of my life needs to be brought back within the boundaries of the Holy Spirit. Or maybe there's something you're seeing right now that's, that has distracted you from the goodness of God. You're, seeing, you're, you're, you're wanting something. You're coveting something. And you know, it's, the, Lord, the Lord does not have that for you. Be content. So ask the Lord today, Lord, I wanna be content with what you have. Lord, there are so many things in my life that I should give you glory for. Start naming them. Name your blessings today. Or maybe there's something out there that trying to take God's place in your life. The pride of life. I don't need God. If I had that, I would need less of God. That's what the enemy is trying to tell you. Father, we come today as your children, sons and daughters, and we confess these temptations are real, they're powerful, they're effective. But Lord, today we thank you that you stand between us and our enemy and you cover us and you strengthen us and you bless us. And by your, in your name and by your authority, because of you, we do not have to live lives in bondage of sin. We can live lives of freedom, lives of joy, lives filled with the goodness of the Lord. So Lord, we, we choose today, we have an insistence today, an insistence on the dependence of God. We are dependent on you. You get all of our worship. You get all of our adoration. You get it all. Come on, let's lift our hands, let's worship today. In just a few minutes, Pastor Eddie's gonna come and lead us in the presence of the Lord, table of the Lord, come and receive the elements and worship the Lord with me.
now as we take these elements into our hands, this is our way of responding to the invitation that the table brings. That invitation back to humility that we're talking about, that invitation back to dependence, it's right here. We say we couldn't do it on our own. Jesus had to do it. That's dependence. And we say we couldn't save ourselves. We wanted to be our own savior, but no, we come humbly to this table and acknowledge only Jesus could do it. Only Jesus could be our savior. And in times where we're told, like we talked about today, that we're just told, you deserve this, you deserve this, you deserve this. You know, the table of Jesus Christ, this is where we give thanks and we say, thank you, God, we did not get what we deserved. <laughs> we did not, we were so thankful, we ended up not getting what we deserved. Jesus in our place, it wasn't his debt he paid, it was our own. And on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. And he broke it. Why don't you just break that right there in your hand? He said, this is my body and it's broken for you. And so now we remember the sacrifice of Jesus together as we eat. After supper, he took the cup. He said, this is the blood of my new covenant. I'm establishing a relationship between you and me and it took the price of my own blood and I shed it for the forgiveness of, you, of your sins. And so now as often we drink it, we drink it in remembrance of him. Come on, let's respond and worship together. Let's sing to the Lord.
is what life following Jesus is like. Yes, there are boundaries, but it's for our good. We're the ones enjoying all the blessings. And I walk out of here with that fresh reminder of like, this, the boundaries are in place, but inside that playground is joy. There's fullness of joy. The greatest life that is available to us is available in Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful that we got to experience that here together this morning. And if you're, if you're new here, uh, we'd love to meet you. We'd love to answer any questions that you have over at Connect Central, out these middle doors to the left, right there in that corner. We'd love to meet you, answer any questions that you have. Also wanna invite the prayer team. If you guys can go ahead and come forward because as soon as I conclude the service, if there's any one of you who, who would like to stay here and have someone pray for you specifically about something that's going on in your life, We'd really love that opportunity. We'd love that privilege to get to pray with you at the end of the service. Also want to let you know that we have section gatherings for sections one and two. All right, you guys, it's your day. Section gatherings, stick around. You can just uh, head over to that space and enjoy uh, some food together. Enjoy some food with God's people. Well, before we head out, can I just pray for you? Why don't you just open your hands? I want to pray a, a blessing over us as we head out. Father. I pray for my brothers and I pray for my sisters standing in this room. I pray that for all the things that are gonna get thrown at them this week, that are going to get put in front of their eyes, the, the things that they're gonna be tempted to lust after that are not the things you have for them, that the lies that are gonna be spoken over them saying, you actually don't need God, you can just do it your way. Right now, God, I pray in the name of Jesus that all of that would fade into the background and that would come into the foreground is just Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I pray that as we walk out here that we would be strengthened by the power of your Holy Spirit to walk into the calling to which we've been called. And I pray this in the name of Jesus, all God's people said, amen, amen. So good worshiping with you. We'll see you next week.